evening, everyone. Welcome to this Wednesday evening and another edition of Crosstalk. Welcome to Trinity Church and this uh, midweek break as we take our breath uh, and uh, consider God's word and look at our life in light of God's word as we prepare our hearts and lives together again and worship on the next Lord's Day. Um, if you were here uh, last Sunday, uh, you'll remember that I've become interested in a movie because, uh, named uh, Every, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Uh, this has been a very popular movie, apparently, and I'm sort of catching the tail end of its popularity. It's been out for a while, but it's attracted uh, a lot of attention at the Academy Awards and certainly attracted a lot of attention at the box offices. It's made a lot of money uh, for uh, those who produced it and those who acted in it. Um, this movie is really an exploration of, of popular culture as it's known today. Uh, as I take a step back, it uh, seems to combine some themes of a popularized version of a philosophy called existentialism and very much a popularized version of quantum physics. And the idea is that we live in a multiverse and that uh, parallel to our experience, parallel to the reality in which we live, um, there are other uh, dimensions that reflect very much the same reality, uh, changed only by the fact that different choices uh, have been made and uh, the reality is, is tweaked in, in sort of a different sort of way. And so here we are living in our reality and at the same time, uh, similar realities are being played out in parallel dimensions, uh, parallel in time and experience to ours. Now, you know, this is an interesting thought experiment and it's been hailed as a, a great uh, absurd sort of comedy uh, it's uh, exploring a lot of hot button themes that we uh, have in our culture today, uh, themes of cultural, ethnic identity, gender identity. Uh, it explores even the theme of nihilism and uh, uh, helps us take a look at what that might look like as uh, the evil uh, against which we battle. Um, and so here we have uh, the, this entertaining movie with martial arts and a lot of special effects thrown into it and uh, apparently it is uh, quite a good time for a great many people uh, to go see and reflect on this reality of a multiverse. But as I think about uh, the premise of uh, this production, uh, it seems to me that it's problematic. Um, this so-called comedy uh, might not be a comedy at all. The very idea that uh, this world is pretty much the world that we have, um, save perhaps some parallel sorts of experience out there, uh, really is, is overwhelming. The idea that um, everything everywhere all at once is placed upon our shoulders uh, is an incredible burden to think, you know, this is all that there is, and this is all that there will ever be. Uh, save maybe some regrets or some longing for some other experience, some other choice that might have been made. Perhaps there's some lessons to be learned. Uh, perhaps we can import those lessons to back into our present experience. But there really isn't any escape uh, from the dimension, from the reality, from the experience that we're given. Um, given that sort of outlook on life, that this is all that there is, uh, all at once, all at the same time, no unfolding future. Uh, that is quite a burden. And no wonder many people, I believe, are depressed. Uh, many people are so overwhelmed. And uh, really, this, this sort of burden has become a mental health uh, danger, I believe. It's a shame that um, we have lost in our culture the Judeo-Christian vision of time and of life. You know, when we turn into the pages of Scripture, we find God's self-revelation there, and we find a creation that uh, comes from God and a creation that is bounded by God and a creation that is moving according to God's plans and purposes. So instead of a, um, a, a multiverse, 
uh, many realities e existing um, side by side. In the Judeo-Christian understanding, we have a universe uh, that comes from one source uh, that is moving according to one purpose and uh, moving according uh, to one goal. And then, of course, in this wonderful Judeo-Christian revelation of creation, uh, as the Bible tells us in those first chapters of Genesis, God looked at God's creation and said, this is good. And at the culmination of creation, uh, on the sixth day, God says, it is not only just good, this creation is very, very, very good. Uh, creation gives us a wonderful sense of the beauty, the wonder, and the possibilities uh, that life provides for us. Now, when we do think of creation, or at least when I do, I do think of Genesis 1 and 2 um, as uh, the place to look uh, for the biblical record of creation. But in fact, when we open the pages of Scripture, uh, creation is splashed across the pages of God's revelation and uh, has so much to say to us about the world in which we live and the life, the gift of life that God has given us. One of the places that creation is explored is in Psalm 104. In Genesis 1 and 2, uh, we uh, understand that God uh, called uh, creation into being by the power of his word. And that uh, wonderful revelation again carries through scripture. Uh, in Psalm 104, we see that uh, image of God refined a little bit. And God is the architect. Uh, God is the builder of this uh, meaningful, purposeful, uh, beautiful creation. Let me share some verses from Psalm 104, verses 1 through 9. Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes the winds his messenger, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. But at your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary that they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. And then in verse 19, the moon marks off the seasons and the sun knows when to go down. You bring darkness, it becomes night, and all the beasts of the forest prowl. The lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. The sun rises and they steal away. They return to lie down in their dens. Then man goes out to his work, to his labor until evening. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and the Leviathan which you formed to frolic there. These all look to you to give them their food at the proper time. And when you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praises to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. That is an incredible revelation of God's creation. 
Now you'll notice a couple of things are happening in this psalm. As we noted, we celebrate God as the great uh, architect, the great builder. In verse 5, he says that God set the earth on its foundations and it can never be moved. So we know that God spoke the worlds into being and then God began to, to build uh, this incredible world in which we live, as well as the galaxy, galaxies that extend way, way, way into eternity. But, you know, the Bible tells us that God didn't end at just the beginning of creation. Uh, Psalm 104 is a reminder um, that part of our creation has its regular patterns. God is not always intervening and fixing things that are broken. God set up a, a, regularly, a regular and orderly progress that extends into the future. Verse 19 says that the moon marks off the seasons and the sun knows when to go down. So there is an order which is built into creation, but there's also a sense in which God is continuing to create and continuing to do new things in God's creation. Uh, we get a sense of that when uh, the psalmist is celebrating God's care of the animal kingdom. In verse 29, when you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. But, verse 30, when you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. So in the biblical understanding of creation, we get this beginning and we get the idea that God is still involved with God's creation in the present. And we begin to understand that God has a future goal for God's creation. Even before the fall in the Garden of Eden, apparently God was not finished with creation because God placed Adam and Eve in the garden and says, I have work for you to do. I need you to continue to build and continue to work until my creation reaches its completion and reaches its consummation. So instead of this idea that we have everything everywhere all at once, the Bible begins to teach us that we have many things spread over a great amount of time headed to a future uh, that we have not yet experienced. Uh, this universe in which we live, uh, according to a single purpose, is, uh, is moving to according to what the great theologian Oscar Kuhlmann called time's arrow. History is time's arrow. Just as an arrow has its, uh, the flight of an arrow has its origins in the notch of the bow and then continues on its flight until its intended target, so we live in a time ordered by God. God set this in motion. God is continuing to work with our creation until creation reaches its climax and its fulfillment. In fact, the Bible tells us that uh, God's purpose for creation, uh, even given the incredible resistance of human rebellion and uh, sin, of, of spiritual evil that somehow has, has worked its way into the created order, the Bible tells us that uh, God's creative purpose is right on track and right on target. And uh, as we reach toward these uh, great bookends of Scripture, the beginning in Genesis and then the end in Revelation, we find out that the, at the consummation of history, at the end of history, is the great marriage feast of the land, Lamb and a great celebration of King Jesus, Messiah, and his purposes in history. And then the unfolding of the heavenly city. And uh, this city is an incredible place of commerce and it's an incredible place of blessing and an incredible place of worship, of life and light. And so God's uh, good creation moving along the arrow of time is moving to a very, very good and wonderful place. Now again, instead of experiencing everything at once, uh, all at the same time, instead of, instead of a wistful sort of uh, hope for some other dimension where things might have been different. Uh, because we Christians are moving according to God's creational plans and we know that there is a good future, uh, we can become a people of hope and not move according to what we hoped might be different in another dimension similar to ours, but we can move according to God's plan 
uh, looking at God's plan of redemption, his plan of salvation, uh, that will reach its culmination at the wedding feast of the Lamb, uh, reach its culmination in the heavenly city, and we can begin to live in this life according to the future that God has given us. Uh, this idea that God has created, that creation in our life has a beginning, uh, this wonderful revelation that uh, we're involved in a story and a narrative that has meaning, that has purpose, uh, and uh, God is involved in appropriate ways in our experience now, uh, both allowing us to move along with natural process, but also to entrust ourselves to his intervention and in his life, his uh, uh, person among us, and then trusting that to move on to a future seems to me to be uh, a life filled with hope, uh, a life filled with expectation, and indeed a life that can be filled with joy no matter what we face. Well, I pray that uh, as you uh, move through these days ahead that you'll uh, continue to explore this idea of God's good creation, exploring it in the pages of um, uh, Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, we encounter this new creation in the Psalms, uh, particularly in Isaiah chapter 40 and following. We see God's new creation celebrated in the prophets. And then as we come to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, uh, the most wonderful revelation of all, that if anyone is in Christ Jesus, they are new creation. Uh, God's new beginnings happen every day. And uh, God's good future uh, is standing before us in Christ Jesus. So my prayer is that you'll take heart, uh, explore creation, enjoy all of its implications, and do not be overwhelmed because it is not everything, everywhere, all at once. It's spread out in bits and pieces that we can digest, bits and pieces that we can encounter and celebrate as we move together with the King toward his glory and toward his coronation. God bless you. Before we uh, end our reflection this afternoon, uh, let me pray with us as we go out into the week ahead. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're not overwhelmed with experience, Lord, uh, but that you have given us a beginning, a middle, and an end, that you have spoken our lives into being, and that you're walking with us today. And as we move toward the end of our story, uh, we thank you for the revelation of resurrection and eternal life and the beginning of a new chapter and the glories and wonder of all that you do, Father, a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation. So, Lord, strengthen our hearts. Give us strength where we are faint and help us to come along those uh, beside those in our own culture and our own time that are just overwhelmed by the burden of being cut off from you and being cut off from life. Uh, Lord, give us access to the lost and a word to lift the weary heads and weary hearts of our comrades and point them toward you, Lord Jesus, to new life and to new hope. Bless our evening, bless our rest, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, thank you, God bless, and God not, a good night, and we look forward to seeing you uh, next Wednesday for another Crosstalk.